That is what it is all about. That's what it should be right there. A simple, very simple dish. Beer braised beef shanks. I can't wait to dig in on that. Howdy folks, welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode, we're going to be making a fantastic meal. Now, I bet many, many people out there in the United States have never tasted beef shanks. And if you're one of those that have never had this dish, you've really missed out. Remember, this is Texas. This is Texas Cooking Today. We cook every part of the cow. Cattle industry here is massive. It is central to Texas, okay? Every bit as much as oil. Oil, cattle, yes, Texas, all right? Beef shanks, that's the lower part of the leg, guys. Now that is a very dense muscle, it's a tough muscle, and it doesn't lend itself well to quick cooking. It takes slow cooking to make good beef shanks. I want to teach you how to do a fabulous dish today. This is called beer braised beef shanks. So we're going to take this naturally gelatinous meat and turn it into the most fabulous tasting braised dish that you're ever going to eat. So guys, let's go into the kitchen and get at it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> there we are. Guys, beer braised beef shanks. Now let's take a look at all these goodies. First off, it's about the beef shank. Now the beef shank, let me get this close to this camera. You see that? Look at all the marbling in that. Now those streaks, that's natural on a beef shank. That's just a normal part of it. And if you'll notice, we have a lot of bone there and there's some marrow involved there. So what we're doing is we're gonna be cooking a lot of flavor into this dish because of all of the wonderful flavors involved in the cut. This isn't a good cut for a steak but when it comes to slow cooking, dang, boy, it's good. Now also, I have some shallots here. I've got some pretty good sized shallots here. And I'm gonna be taking these shallots, we're gonna slice them up and throw them right down in there. No fancy slicing, just some rings of it. We're gonna be putting some garlic in this one. All right, I'll probably be putting in there anywhere from four to eight cloves of garlic. Put it in that way to your taste. If you like garlic, go a little more. If you don't, back off of it some. The shallots are nice because they add a light oniony flavor without overwhelming the dish. It just makes it a rich flavor. We're going to put salt, pepper in there. We're going to be using a little olive oil in the beginning as I start cooking these things up because we're going to develop flavor before the braising process. And I'm going to show you that little technique. I've got some Worcestershire sauce here. This is essential to this dish. It's very good. It adds an intense sharp spike of acid and flavor that's fantastic. Also, of course, our beer. Now I'm using some home brew here. This is some of my own homemade goody. All right, so the only way you're gonna reproduce this dish exactly is to learn how to make what I make. Or if you wish, go to the store and get a nice amber. It's a perfect way to start cooking this dish is with an amber. If you want something more full body, go with a brown beer. And if you don't want alcohol at all anywhere near your diet, I understand. They do make non-alcoholic beers, guys. Okay, so go get you some non-alcoholic beer to make this dish if you are concerned about that in any way, shape, or form. Also, it needs to be mentioned that every bit of the alcohol in this is going to be completely cooked out. After all, this is something that takes hours to cook slowly. So guys, Come over this way and let me show you how we get busy fixing fantastic flavor that's just going to blow everyone away. Now, come on. Okay, guys. Now, as I always teach on Texas Cooking Today, we do what's called the setup method. This is a very simple, very simple dish to make. But whenever you're cooking, regardless of the simplicity of the dish, life gets a lot easier 
if you do some prep work before the cooking starts. So that's what I'm doing. And the nice thing about this is, is you never have to worry about something burning while you're busy attending to something else because those something else's were already taken care of in advance like I'm doing now. If you wish to use cooking gloves, of course I do, you've seen me do it in many of my shows, it's a really nice thing because it's easy to clean up. Now after I dehusk my garlic, I'm going to go ahead and remove the paper from the outside of my shallots. And the way to do that, as with any onion, a shallot just grows in layers. Now guys, as with a lot of different kinds of onions, the outer layer on a shallot can be a bit thin in spots, so go ahead and just get it out of your way. Now I'm going to remove that root end on each of these, get those out of my way, and I can simply slice these up to go down in my dish. Nothing fancy on those slices, just cut it down. It doesn't have to be accurate or pretty. And the reason I say these don't have to be pretty, guys, after they're cooked, they're not going to be distinguishable from anything else, okay? Give them a gentle crush. And you don't have to just demolish it when you crush it, guys. It just has to be broken open so that it will cook out its oils quickly and easily and cook down easily. There we go. Our garlic is ready to go in and so are our shallots. Okay guys, I'm getting ready to sear off my beef shanks. Now something I need to let you know, when you're gonna sear meat, we do this for the purpose of creating flavor, okay? And also sometimes to lock moisture into meat. Not so much when we're braising, but definitely to make flavor when we're braising. It starts with a really, really, really hot pot. And how do you know if your pot is hot enough? Well, it's simple guys, you simply throw water in it. Okay, do you see? how water is skating around. It doesn't sizzle off immediately. Okay, what's going on there is what is referred to as the Leidenfrost effect, okay? And it's named after a scientist we'll called no, Leidenfrost, of course. You know, as a scientist, when you discover something, you get to name it. And a lot of scientists name things after themselves, like Fahrenheit is scale. So anyway, we have reached that temperature which gives us a sear. Now something I need to say, if you're ever cooking pork chops or, or searing meat like this and it curls on you, it's because there is a band of fat on the outside of it. And that band of fat, what it does is it contracts in one direction. And if you want that to not happen, we'll simply cut that band of fat. And I want to do that in a couple of spots here. So what that does is it just reduces how that fat affects this process. Now, toss it in there. I'm only looking to create some brown, both on the meat as well as in the pot. Because this is the pot I'm gonna cook this in, guys, right here. Now here's the thing, guys. Every bit of the brown that's on the meat right now, all of that, during the braising process is going to wash off of the meat and become a part of the complex flavors of this dish. All right, guys, I'm pulling my last piece of meat out of this. Look at all the brown in the bottom of that, okay? Now, what am I going to do next? Well, this is where we deglaze the pan. So let me open up one of these goodies. Oh, yeah. Oh, ho, ho. yeah. I have my beer in there and I am deglazing the bottom of that pan. So what I've done here, guys, I've just developed this magnificent beefy flavor to go with that beer. And any of those bits on the bottom of the pan that don't immediately deglaze right now, don't worry, they're gonna deglaze in the cooking. Not to worry. Let's go ahead and get our meat in here again. Okay, so let's open up another one of these. And I brought out three bottles for a reason. And so you'll know I started with four pounds of beef here, guys. Okay, so that ended up being about two and a half bottles of beer. Guys, about a half of a teaspoon of salt, okay? And about the same on some black pepper. 
about a half a teaspoon. If you don't have a pepper mill that really kicks one out, guys, I feel sorry for you. Uh, there's only one brand I ever found that really did the trick. And as I told you, I don't tout brands on my show. But frankly, if you want to know the truth, there's this company called William Bounds. Their pepper grinders really kick it out. And this one right here is about eight, maybe nine years old. Still kicking up a storm. Next, our shallots. That's right, just right down in there. No particular order. Our garlic, same way. Don't worry, all that's going to get cooked together. Now, how much of that Worcestershire sauce, guys? I want to say one third to one half of a cup. All right? So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to measure out a third of a cup here. We're going to go down in our pot with it. And again, like I said, what this is doing, this is going to A, give it some seriously good flavor, and B, it's going to contribute to the acid level in this in a major way. So there we go. One third. Now, this goes down into my oven. I have started my oven at 350 degrees, and as soon as this goes in it, I'm going to lower it to 250. Okay, guys, now let's get this down in our oven. Oh, yeah. Right in there. There we go, guys. Now, I've started that 350 degrees, and the reason I do that, that brings that liquid up in temperature real quick because the oven starts out a little hotter. Now I'm pulling the temperature back down to 250 right now, and that way it's going to sit there and slow cook. Now what do you do in the meantime? Oh, this is really easy. Hold on, let me get this. You either go watch the game or watch a movie or go hang out with your friends or whatever. You just leave it in there. Come back a few hours later, put a fork in it. If the meat slips off of the fork too easily, we're ready for the next step. But if not, we need to go and hang out a little more. So guys, this is one of those slow cooked days where you just take life easy. I'll talk to you later. Now guys, take a look at this. These have been in the oven now for, oh, about four hours. They're pretty much coming apart. Not gonna be a problem getting those bones separated out, is it? The dogs are gonna be happy, <laughs> I'm telling you now. And the rest of this meat, quite literally, coming apart. So it is literally falling off the bone, okay? That's what we were looking for. So go ahead and just pull all of your meat right out of your braising liquid. We're, we're gonna be using that braising liquid and we're gonna make a wonderful gravy with it. And that's our next step. Wait till you try this gravy, guys. Oh, <laughs> it is so good. I have a skillet right behind this pot that I'm putting all of this in. And there's a couple of ways that you can do your gravy. You can make your gravy right in the pot that you've cooked everything in, which is a great way of doing it. You can also pour your gravy off into another pot. In a moment, I'm gonna pour all of this liquid right down through a strainer to separate anything that's left because I want my gravy to be nice and clean. No specks or chunks or, or bits or anything like that in it. It's going to be nice and smooth. Okay guys, now when you want to go ahead and save your liquids from braising to make gravy with, you need something to separate all of that out. I have here a pot and a strainer. I'm simply going to take what's left in this, pour it through the strainer. Now guys, I have gone ahead and put the meat back in that larger pan and put it down in my oven. The oven is off, it's just to keep it warm. I put the lid back on it. Now you see what I'm doing here? I've taken a spoon and in my juices here, I'm gently lowering that spoon just to the point that something starts flowing over the edge. There we go. Now what I'm collecting here, as that fluid flows in there, the majority of what's dropping into that is what's referred to as tallow. That's the fatty acids that are, uh, or excuse me, the, 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 I'm so sorry. That is the um, saturated fat that is in beef. And that's the part of this that we're not really that interested in. So I'm just gonna sift some of it out of here. So do this for a little bit and the clear liquid that pools into your spoon, that is actually that saturated fat you don't want. 
if you lose a little of the other stuff in the process you're not losing a whole lot of problems guys I mean, it's not a big problem you're not losing a whole lot so it's better to go ahead and do a little bit of this just to get rid of the majority of what's in there okay I've gotten rid of most of that now it's time to turn this into gravy the first thing I need to do is start a fire under this so I can bring it up to a boil so I'm going to put a medium high heat under this okay guys I have about one third of a cup of flour here and my shaker you can use just a regular mason jar for this also I'm going to place my flour right down in here and cold water this is important I have to stress this guys do not use hot water under no circumstances use hot water for this if you do you're going to be shocked at what you're going to get it's going to expand and explode when you shake it it's this funky property that flour has when you heat it suddenly with hot water it just and uh, suddenly you're covered give it a good shake together now what I'm going to do is I want to mix this in with those juices I have coming up in temperature on my stove now guys the big question is how much of this do I use when I'm going to be making gravy well I'm going to make this simple on you you can always add more but you can't take any out okay does that answer your question depends on how much liquid is in here so I just poured in about half and what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow that to come up in temperature and thicken and that tells me if I need more or not we're going to produce a most fabulous tasting brown gravy this way guys the thing you need to remember is please just keep stirring it okay when it comes up in temperature you will see it thicken quickly you'll know it now that's not when it's finished it's not done once it's thickened it's finished once you have cooked out that flour flavor and guys I have a medium high temperature to bring this up guys I have just tasted this and it is wonderful I'm adding about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt and I'm going to add some more of that Worcestershire sauce not a lot maybe about a tablespoon there we go all that is is to give it a light spike in its acid content that will help those flavors that are already present to really jump out and be a little more up front there it is guys I have dished it all up we are ready to go now I've got a little bit of spinach on my plate and of course that beautiful braised beef and this magnificent gravy that I have made for it. I'm going to gently just ladle over it until it cascades lightly off of the sides. There we go. That is what it is all about. That's what it should be right there. A simple, very simple dish. Beer braised beef shanks. I can't wait to dig in on that. Well guys, there it is. Beer braised beef shanks. These things, oh man. You know, it's wonderful when you can take a simple, humble, delicious cut of meat. A beautiful thing there. Oh man. It's rich. Complex, deep, beefy, full-bodied flavor. Oh, man. And the perfect drink to pair to it. Guys, wait till you try it. It's so good, so tasty. And when you've tried these beef shanks cooked this way, you're like, oh, wow. I didn't know it was going to be that good. You'll be surprised. Will you try it? Guys, thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. For watching this episode, thank you for my subscribers. Guys, I appreciate you more than you know. And if you haven't subscribed, folks, if you would, please do so. I would like to ask if you would, please click the like button. That really helps me in the rankings a lot. 
And one last thing, guys, just one last thing. If you would, please, just have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>